Okay, so you should have watched the introductory video to the section about the Roman Empire already. And now we're going to go back to the beginning of that and kind of look at developments related to the art and architectural history of Rome, uh, starting with the Republic of Rome. Okay. All right, so the first thing that we're going to look at is uh, the Temple of Fortunas, which is also called the Temple of Fortuna Virila. And um, I just want you to take a second to look at this and then think about what you know about Greek temples um, from, from our unit on ancient Greece. And then also kind of think about what you know about the Etruscans and their take on temples as well. So we don't have... Um, any remnants uh, of, of the Etruscan temples because they were made out of wood, but we did talk about that and we know kind of the layout and what they looked like. So, um, one of the things to note about this um, is that this is pretty typical of Republican Roman temple design. And uh, we have kind of a mix of elements from Greek architecture and from um, Etruscan architecture. So um, one of the things that we see with Rome is they take up, they borrow a lot of things from a lot of different cultures, particularly the Greeks uh, in terms of architecture, but they don't follow all the rules. So the Greeks were very persnickety, remember the ancient Greeks, about their um, architectural orders and following the rules within those orders. So it was Doric or it was Ionic and here are the rules and here's how it goes. So the Romans just kind of took the elements of that that they liked incorporated them with other ideas from other cultures and just put it all together and kind of broke all the rules. Okay, so this temple, um, we can see we're at a Greek temple and we were just looking at the columns. We would identify it as the Ionic order, right? Because we've got our volutes, our little swirlies on top of the, the capitals for the columns. Uh, we have a pediment. Um, but if we look at the layout of this thing, it's very atypical um, when compared to, to Greek temples. So we have, uh, it's symmetrical in one direction, but not in the other. We have columns on the front uh, in the proneos or porch. Uh, in the naos, notice it is not open. It's closed off and we have these engaged columns, which is not a Greek thing. We've not seen that yet in Greek architecture, so this is a newly Roman thing. An engaged column is just a column that's been like sliced in half and attached to a solid wall, okay? And so when it's rounded in like a column like this, that's an engaged column. When it's rectangular and kind of squared off on the sides, which we'll also see, that's called a pilaster, okay? So we have engaged columns all the way around the naos, um, and the only area that's open where you can just walk up the stylobate and go in through the open columns is on the proneos or porch. We also have no opening, no entrance in the back. There's only one entrance and that is at the front of the temple. Also uh, significantly less sculpture. Okay, so we have a pediment, we have a cornice, we have um, a frieze, which is open. It doesn't have the metopes because this is um, ionic order. Um, but we don't, it's not quite as heavily adorned. A little bit about the specific temple, uh, it's dedicated to the Roman god of harbors. So this is someone that you would like make an offering to if you were say a merchant who was, who had a big shipment of things you were sending out or, or expecting in. Um, and then when you look at the structure of it, other than just aesthetically it being this interesting combination of like an Etruscan plan with some elements of Greek uh, ionic order on top of it. Um, it's also overlaid with stucco. So it's made out of tufa, which is this sort of rough kind of sandstone-like um, stone from this area. And then it's overlaid with like a stucco plaster kind of um, amalgamation that has, uh, it's much smoother. So it's, it's to make it look like marble. And sometimes they would actually grind up marble dust, mix it in with that solution and put it over the face and a little bit of marble dust and it would make it look like marble. Um, okay, so this is pretty typical of uh, Republic era temples in Rome. Let's look at another example of a different kind of temple. This is the temple of Vesta. Remember Vesta is the Roman name for Hestia, so the uh, goddess of the hearth. Um, 
And this is a tholos. You've seen the word tholos before, uh, originally when we were in the prehistoric Aegean unit. Tholos is a round temple, right? So it's completely round. This is in Tivoli, which is east of Rome. And here we have a circular plan, which is sometimes called a central plan. That terminology will come back later when we're looking at Byzantine churches. Um, and this is uh, the circular kind of plan for a temple becomes very typical of Vesta. This becomes kind of a thing for temples to Vesta tend to be tholos or round. Um, she's a vir virgin goddess of home and hearth. You'll also notice if you look at the columns, what order this is, it's Corinthian. So that's that later third order that comes in um, that we talked about in the very late classical, right before the Hellenistic period. So we have volutes, we have the little swirlies like Ionic, but we also have these uh, leaves, this kind of flora on here. Um, and they're a little bit fancy, a little bit more um, ornate in their decor. Okay. Um, it's interesting because it is symmetrical, mostly. It's symmetrical that if you slice it um, vertically, but if you slice it horizontally, it is not because even though the style of bite beat goes all the way around and we have columns that are open all the way around that are fully in the round, you can only enter through one way. So you can't walk, walk up from all directions like you could on a Greek temple. So there's still only one entryway. Okay, uh, and this is made out of concrete. So we're going to spend some time talking about concrete now because it's one of the most important uh, inventions by the Romans. So um, it always kind of blows my mind to think about concrete being this old of an invention because it seems like such a, a 20th century thing, doesn't it? Like such a thing that would come in with the modern era going into uh, the contemporary era. But it's actually um, an ancient Roman invention. So two really important things structurally in Rome are concrete and the arch. So the arch structurally can support a lot more weight than um, just uh, lint pill uh, pillars and lintels, you know. So this is discovered as being this important structural thing. And then if you extend an arch backward in space, you get a barrel vault, also very structurally significant. You're able to build higher because the weight of the ceiling is distributed through the walls, which you can thicken with uh, supports called buttresses. Then if you intersect two of these barrel vaults, you get a groin vault, which is even more structurally strong. And if you have several of those, you can fenestrate them. Fenestration means it has windows, it's been pierced. So it's a strong enough structure that you can have these high ceiling things with windows. And again, the weight is all um, kind of sent down through these buttressed walls. If you spin an arch in space, you get a uh, dome. And in a, a lot of these Roman domes, they like to put an oculus in the center. Oculus means eye, so it's like a round skylight. OK, so let's learn a little bit more about concrete, which makes all of these things possible and, and creates this kind of revolution in terms of architecture and structure. Um, concrete in uh, Roman times is called opus uh, semimeticium, which is made out of lime mortar, volcanic sand and ash, water, and small stones, which are called caminta. Um, so they figured out that they could make these great structures with concrete. It's very flexible as a material. You can mold it however you want, and it's strong. So it's flexible and makes you be able to do lots of things, and also it's very strong. So this is discovered, but then maybe they're not super crazy about the way it looks. So then there are development of things like revetments, which um, are uh, a facing used to cover rough concrete. So like a thin veneer of marble can be applied to the outside or sometimes stucco and plaster to smooth it out and, and make it look uh, in their aesthetic better. Uh, barrel vault, we just looked at an image of this. This is like a tunnel vault, right? Like you're extending an arch backward in space. Um, buttressing is the lateral support. So this like thicker part of the wall right here, that's buttressing. Groin vaults is when we cross uh, two barrel vaults. Fenestrated is a, um, is you can add windows to, to groin vaults. Uh, hemispherical domes are rounded domes, right? And then oculus is the eye in the center. 
So these inventions um, are a big deal. Uh, the binders in, uh, well, let me just tell you a little bit about the ingredients in, in concrete. So it's um, basically like a hydraulic setting cement. So it has volcanic ash, which is called pozzolana, um, which makes it more durable and lighter. Um, the binders were gypsum and quicklime, and then tufa as aggregate, uh, which is a, that stone that I told you about earlier. And there's a high content of alumina and uh, silica in this. <clears throat> okay, <coughs> excuse me. So once we have concrete, we have arches, we have barrel vaults, we have all these great inventions. Lots of different structural things can be done. This is the Sanctuary of Fortuna Primogenia um, in Palustrina, Italy. So this um, was dedicated to the goddess of good fortune and it's terraced. It reminds me, if we look at the reconstruction, a little bit of Hatshepsut's mortuary temple that we looked at in uh, our Egyptian unit. So we have it kind of built into the hillside and have all these terracings. Under each of these terrace areas, you'll see these arches. Each one of these arches has a barrel vault, okay? Even the blind arches over here would originally have had barrel vaulting underneath, which could support all of this heavy structure that was up above. So now you can see this part has been lost to time, but this bottom part that was holding everything up still exists today, and stuff's been added to it. They've built apartment complexes and things on top of this because this is still, uh, this is still <laughs> structurally sound, even though it dates back to the late second century BC, which is crazy, right? This 2000 year old thing that's holding up uh, contemporary uh, apartment buildings. Um, so it's made entirely of concrete, supported by all these barrel vaults. There was at one point a like uh, demi tholos, a half tholos temple at the top. Um, so all of this structurally, because the concrete is so fortified and strong, and because of the structural significance of the barrel vaulting and arches, is still standing today. All right, let's shift gears a little bit and look at <clears throat> some typical uh, sculptural works from the Republican time frame. Republican meaning the Republic of Rome pre-Empire, um, not Republican like the contemporary political party, just to clarify our terms. Okay, so portrait art becomes a big thing. If you remember in the introduction, I talked to you about um, how society is kind of broken down into these two major uh, groups of people. The patricians, which are the wealthy landowning people, and the plebeians, who are um, merchants, laborers, farmers, freed slaves, uh, this kind of thing. One of the things with patrician society that we see is this interest in showing your lineage, kind of. So showing that you have ancestors. And so we start seeing portrait art being a big part of that. And uh, one of the things are uh, imagines. So imagines are um, kind of like masks. They're like death masks. They're wax likenesses, casts of people's faces. And so in a patrician home in Rome, when you walk in, in the entryway, you find um, a shelf with all these wax casts of people's faces, okay? And then, um, they'd be worn for certain days that honored the dead, they would be worn in a processional kind of funerary parade to, to celebrate your lineage and your ancestors. Um, there's a, a Greek author named uh, Polybius who wrote the history of early Rome and he writes about this pretty extensively. So this interest in ancestors and showing that you have lineage and have ancestors um, being kind of your mark of your society, your place in society, that you're like a wealthy patrician person, becomes something that influences the way art looks. So we start seeing an interest in verism. Verism is something that we've heard about before. It means um, truth in imagery, basically. And uh, so what it does is it's showing someone with their wrinkles and with their receding hairline with um, the signs of age. That's called verism. And uh, so it's, it's a pretty high contrast to what we've seen before, which is this interest in showing people um, kind of immortal, like forever young, eternally looking timeless and young like a god. Um, so we see this interest in, in verism instead. 
Uh, so here is a patrician man. He's, I, I think he's a senator. I can't remember exactly who this is. He, you can see that he has some wrinkles. His hairline is receding, so he's older. And he's holding these busts of his ancestors to show that he is a patrician, that he has this heritage, okay? Um, all right. So one of the other things that happens during this time because of this interest in verism is we also have this Roman idea that a bust, so just the head, shoulders, a little bit of the chest, is um, a perfectly suitable portrait in sculpture. Um, Greeks did not do that because, remember, they were so interested in ratios and proportion and anatomy and, and things like that, that it would never have occurred to them to create just a, a bust of a per just their head would be bizarre. So this is very much a Roman thing. Here we have another example of a Roman patrician. We can see all of his wrinkles and that he is balding. So he is uh, the epitome of verism. He is older. He is obviously a powerful patrician man. And then we see this interesting thing where we have a dichotomy, a difference between the head of a sculpture and the body. So this is a portrait of a Roman general, and we can see his head, he's kind of wrinkly, he's got a little bit of a double chin, his hairline is receding, so very much verism in the head, but then he has this like young, hot body, <laughs> which seems really bizarre, but this becomes very popular, because the idea is in your face, you can show your age and your ancestry and all the verism and that you're older and wiser and have this place in society, but you could still like have your body portrayed as being young and fit and, and, and uh, this emblem of athleticism. So we see these strange kind of constructed um, sculptures where the head and the body don't match, which is strange. And this guy being a gen general, he's wanting to show off this young body, which he didn't have, okay? But he still wants it known that he's a general. So you can see his cuirass, which is that fitted leather um, plate armor that, that Romans wore on the side here. So it's this very weird thing that we see at this um, time period. Okay, uh, so the Daenerys, this is a coin, a Roman coin called a Daenerys with the portrait of Julius Caesar. Um, and on it, it says dictator perpetuus, which means dictator for life, because remember, he didn't want to give back his dictator powers. He wanted to be um, an emperor. Um, this is a, a standard Roman silver coin from which the, the term um, penny comes from. And one of the things you'll notice here is his hairline is receding and he has wrinkles. So we see an example of verism in this coin. The other thing that's really brilliant about this is Caesar wanted to get everyone on his side. He wanted the public to be in favor of him being the dictator perpetuous. So he put his own face on the money. So anytime someone handled money, they'd be reminded of his face and think, oh, I'm prosperous and doing well because I, we have a dictator now instead of just a consul with the Senate. He was the first non-deity to be put on a coin. So previously, Roman coins had had uh, the gods and goddesses on them. So it's this interesting kind of act of political um, kind of uh, propaganda, basically. This is around 44 BC. So this is the first time that we see this. Um, okay. Another thing that we see at this time are uh, some interesting things happening with uh, funerary portraiture. So at this time in Italy, um, there are two million slaves. That's a third of the population. Everywhere the Romans conquered, they captured people and, and made them slaves. So there are slaves from all different parts of Europe uh, that are part of um, this Roman Empire now. and. Um, so one of the things uh, that was common practice was you, you granted your slaves their freedom upon your death, and sometimes before your death. Um, and this was a common practice in the, in the Roman Empire. Slavery is horrible, obviously, and it is not a good thing in any context uh, at all. But this is a little bit different than what we typically think of. It's not a little bit. It's a lot different than what we think of in terms of American history and slavery. Um, it's you have a path to citizenry and whatnot in in the Roman Empire that's that's different. Again, slavery bad in all contexts, obviously. Um, so one of the things freed slaves could do is they could commission artwork. 
And so you'd have things like this. So this is uh, Publius uh, Jessius was the owner of these slaves. Uh, Jessia Fosta and Jessia Primus, that's the names of the slaves. You'll notice that there is a commonality between the name, Jessia, Jessius, and Jessius. It's because the owner of the slaves gave them his name, and so then there's this commissioned portrait of them together, like this, uh, as a family, as a family name. So then it gives the ability to establish an ancestry or, or heritage or lineage, which had become so important in the Roman Republic in terms of society. So then once the slaves are freed after his death, they can also be like, this is my last name, this is my family heritage, I'm a legitimate member of society, and proving this kind of um, societal recognition through commissioned artwork is a really interesting connection there. Okay, next we will talk about Pompeii and talk some more about uh, Roman houses and painting and things like that.